afternoon. Welcome to the flight straight to data science mistakes. <laughs> Um, so welcome to SQL Bits. Um, this afternoon we'll be discussing most common whatever mistakes in data science that one can find. Uh, but before we begin, for those who haven't seen me for the past five years, I've only been online. But if you want to get in touch, feel free. All the session materials are available at my GitHub account. Uh, common data science mistakes should be the name of the repo, so feel free to... Um, make a um, clone, whatever you want to do. Otherwise, I've been in the field for quite long, so for those who don't know me, um, I also written a couple of books and, and, and blogs and stuff like that. Uh, but before we begin, I said, um, it says that I'm a data scientist. Um, and actually, I'm not. <laughs> um, so this was taken from Twitter way back, X now, um, and who is the data scientist? It was a long discussion about um, who is data scientist and who is not. Um, and there was a nice um, definition. So a data scientist is a statistician who lives in San Francisco uh, and owns a MacBook. I don't know. Um, I switched to MacBook, so that's one thing. Um, I am a statistician, but unfortunately, I'm not from San Francisco. I'm coming from Ljubljana, Slovenia, so yeah, I'm not a data scientist. So who is a data scientist? Um, a data scientist is a modern-looking, fancy-dressed guy with a tie, uh, but apparently um, all the knowledge is the main skills, math, programming, and, of course, communication, which literally translates to a statistician. I cannot work that way around, but that's it. So anyways, um, for the icebreakers, um, agenda for today, um, I've managed to sort of group the mistakes, the most common mistakes that I've seen, that you've probably seen, uh, that you will find all over the field. Uh, the business mistakes, data preparation mistakes, data explore, exploration, data exploring mistakes, modeling and measuring, and of course, visualizations uh, for the end, so to get some laughs and stuff like that. But first of all, let's get you started. Um, can somebody or anybody answer, let's say, the first question? What is regularization and why it is useful? And by the way, this was taken, this is the source, this was taken from 20 questions, how to detect a fake data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody has courage to say what it is? Well, um, you know, usually what we do in statistics is we penalize the data to fix and, and feed it to a cost function. So this is what essentially this does. We have two forms of regularization, L1, L2 really depends on what we do with these errors that we want to either put it to the zero, but essentially this is it. And we can go on and on and on. And these are, oh, there's are only 13, but apparently there were 20. Um, all these questions you can easily ask and see if somebody is a data scientist or not. So it's um, up to you. Um, anyways. Um, Let's start with the domain knowledge and soft skills. Um, what I've seen most of the time is that um, if you don't know your domain knowledge, you will have later problems um, with feature engineering, for instance. This is one of probably the clearest and the fastest one. Um, not knowing your business will sort of give you problems when making feature engineering. If I go a little bit back, uh, at the beginning, you will also see that not knowing your business, you will have problems understanding data. So whenever you're doing data exploration, stuff like that, if you don't know the business, you don't know how to translate this business to the data, you will have a hard time understanding the data. Um, of course, you have to know your limits. And of course, you have to know your applied knowledge. Um, from what I've seen, um, a lot of times, a lot of companies, focus on problem or problems and not the tools. 
the tool is just a car that essentially will get you from A to B. If you don't know how to define a problem, you will have problems defining and getting the right goal, tool, whatever. So this is quite important. So don't do tooling, focus on problems. Um, structure a plan, my favorite quote, of course, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Let that sink in. Um, and be man manageable and know when to stop complicating or when not to oversimplify. Sometimes, you know, there's quite a lot of rules like Pareto rules, 80, 20, 10, 90, whatever you want to call it. Um, you will have this simplification. At some point, you have to stop. And this is the domain knowledge that we all need to understand that um, with the help of that, we definitely can get a uh, better understanding of the data and the problem we want to focus. So a couple of those common mistakes are already deriving from the main knowledge and this soft skills. Soft skills, of course, are very important. Um, if you don't know how to communicate with the customer, it's going to be hard for you to understand what their problem is. And later on, when uh, presenting the solution, it will have the same effect. Um, selecting different tools. The tool is just, you know, the weapon of choice. I've stated a couple of those. For me, it really doesn't matter. It can be a matter of cost, it can be a matter of knowledge, but essentially a tool is a tool, whether you like to write everything in Transect SQL, in Python, whether you want to use Java, whether you want to go Azure, AWS, it doesn't really matter. All the tools will deliver essentially the same results. Um, but again, not focusing on the problem and focusing on selecting the tools or having different tools might sort of skew the vision that you want to, or the path that you want to take. So um, learn to know the difference, but remember that all these different tools will guide you to the same solution. And the tools, the reason why I'm saying this is, um, I'll give you an example with the terminology. For those who are my age or even older, you can remember all the way up to 95, I think that the word statistics was very popular. And then all of a sudden, 1995, maybe 2000, 2010, data mining emerged. And for the past 10 years or so, we, we've seen data science. Fancy words, yeah, of course, there are differences. I totally agree. But where I cannot understand until now is the essentially all the algorithms in behind are still the same. Meaning that everything either you want to say is based on analysis of variance, whether you take regression in statistics, whether you take regression in data mining or in data science. So these are, again, the same thing that you can find in different terminology. And the same goes with interfaces. You know, when they say the history repeats itself, I, uh, raise your hands if, if, if you are from this era. <laughs> okay, I see a couple of hands. And then it became very fancy to do all the UI and stuff like that, and, and fancy decision trees. And then again, all of a sudden, let's go back to code. And we have the full circle. I don't know which one is better, don't ask me. Uh, it's really, again, up to you. It's your flavor. Um, there are pluses and minuses on both sides. But again, I see today when people write Python code, what we did, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, 30, 25 ish. I'm not. Um, yes, again, remember choosing the tool wise decision, getting the right one. It's not a deal breaker in terms of finishing the project or focusing on the problem. Okay, so now over the business part, let's go to data preparation. Um, some general idea and concepts that I've seen a lot of people are 
um, sort of ignoring is a couple of those written right here. Whether you start the data um, using SQL, um, I've seen duplicate values when joining two tables. It's a very, very common problem. Um, neglecting the null values, whatever you want to call them, but however you want to note them, whether it's null, NA, zero, empty parentheses, whatever. Um, when it comes to ordering the data, especially the type of the variables that you are using, again, sometimes order is extremely important. And also, for those who are in the world of Python, in the world of R, in the world of Julia, ordering your data sets is also extremely important. Before you merge the data, you have to have data ordered. All this is, again, common mistakes that people tend to ignore or tend to forget. And hanging out with outliers, this is my favorite one. It was <clears throat> taken out of um, some meme. Um, yeah, we tend to forget about the outliers. And I'll show you in the next demo on a very, very simple R data set what can happen if you neglect the concept of outliers. OK, um, the second thing is data exploration. There are quite a lot of um, different preliminary tests uh, that can check different assumptions, different correlations, and all the statistical tests. Anybody know the difference between correlation and causation? This is my segue to the next slide. Nice. OK, so the next slide is, I know I'm in UK, don't, don't get me wrong. Anybody seen this? The Brexit and Metcalf disease. And by the way, this is fake. This was debunked, so, but I like the concept of differences between causation and, and, and correlation. So um, this is the Brexit. And then the guy behind just made it black and white sort of reflecting, yeah, this is 1992 when the UK had the medical disease problem. Um, and what it says is that uh, there is a huge correlation. Of course, this was the debate, then it was later debunked. The guy said, okay, it was just, you know, I, I just made a joke of it, um, saying that those areas that voted for Brexit are highly correlated with the same areas of those where medical disease was present. I know it's absurd, but again. And then you can ask yourself, did, you know, the magical question, did, <laughs> of course you're laughing, did the mad cow disease cost UK to be in favor of Brexit? I don't know. But this is the difference between correlation and causation, you know. There is a huge, huge correlation. Uh, of course, again, keep in mind those two graphs are fake, debunked, uh, there is a, very, very high correlation if we say that this is Brexit and medical disease, but can we assume that there is also causation? We can't. Or at least we need some third-party data variables that essentially will tell us that this is caused by some third-party, third variable or so. So I'm gonna jump into my R environment and I'm gonna continue with this example. So. I like to play with data, and uh, this is a toy example. Again, don't get me wrong. Um, so what I did was I created um, a small data set saying a person likes sugar or dislikes sugar. Um, this is the weight. It's in kilos, hopefully. Um, and what I did was I calculated the simple correlation coefficient. So I'm just gonna run this, and it should be saying that the higher the number, um, the more correlated, correlated, not caused, uh, the like sugar and weight is. So the, we can say that there is a strong correlation or, or semi-strong correlation between people who like um, sugar um, tend to have higher, you know, kilos, like me. Um, and then I can play around and go further down and say, okay, now I'm gonna introduce the pregnancy. 
Uh, so I assume that um, these weights are female weights. Uh, I am ignoring the race, the height, everything. So I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna go with pregnant or not pregnant, and I'm gonna rerun the I'm gonna rerun the correlation. Correlation, sorry. And immediately I see down here that uh, if you like sugar, you are very highly re correlating with pregnancy. So I can ask myself, does pregnancy, no, sorry, I can ask myself the other way around. If I like sugar, would I get pregnant? Of course, the other way around makes sense. <laughs> so again, this is, again, I'm just playing with correlations. Um, and I can say, I can ask myself questions like that. So is sugar correlating with gaining weight? Of course it does, but does it cause pregnancy? I don't know, you tell me. Okay, so this is an example of the difference between correlation and, and um, causation. We tend to name those variables like uh, input variable um, that sort of tries to explain why this correlation is happening, um, that it's not, cause it's not causing the correlation, it's just sort of explaining the correlation. And we know what causes pregnancy. I would say that sugar might help. Uh, next time <clears throat> I'm doing that demo, I'll put instead of like sugar, I'll go likes alcohol, which will give me much better results with the pregnancy. I'm just joking, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, and I said uh, the next example is um, playing with outliers. So I have a, a very small data set, um, cars data set. Uh, I can um, just... <clears throat> give you a sense, an idea. So I'm taking the, the speed and the distance. Uh, and I'll be calculating um, the correlation or the, um, between those two. So I can check my data. Again, simple, simple, small data set just, you know, to tie around. And I can see that with speed, uh, there is a huge um, um, also raise in um, with um, the, the distance. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna plot those two, okay. So we can see this is a very, very simple linear um, regression, so distance and speed. And you can see this blue line is essentially showing me the correlation how those dots are essentially correlated. And this is like a line saying, um, if I go 25 miles or kilometers per hour, I might be uh, at the distance of 150. As you can see, you know, those dots here and those four dots here, sort of, they all have a huge influence on this line. But what happens if I say, hmm, those four dots here, are causing some instability in my data. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna plot the same graph, um, but without those four dots. Uh, just a second, showing it right here. And all of a sudden we can see there is a totally different distribution, the same distribution as beforehand, but this line is now much more uh, this one was super steep, this one is super less steep. And you can see if I take um, the speed of 25 kilometers or miles per hour, I will be at distance around 60. Beforehand, 25, I would be 125. And this is the difference what causes if I am hanging out with outliers, uh, neglecting outliers, and there is a lot of statistical tests statistical tests where you can find um, different um, methodologies, how to uh, find those. This is super clean example, but usually the data of course is not that clean and we might have issues and problems. Okay, um, the second demo is, um, it's more like a myth. Uh, do we know when the data needs to be correlated? 
there are different types of uh, machine learning algorithms when one they say data should not be correlated the other ones say data should be correlated any ideas no anybody teaching learning in the fields of psychology no hands okay uh, psychologists, for instance, use uh, factor analysis. Anybody heard of that? Uh, sorry? Factor analysis. Uh, they are keen on that, and one of the huge assumptions that they have is that all the input data must be highly correlated in order for you to find the factors, which essentially is data reduction um, um, method. Um, on the other hand, if you do, for instance, if you do Bayesian statistics, Yes, we don't want data to know about each other. We don't want to have data correlating. So again, this is not really a myth, but I've seen people using highly correlating data in machine learning algorithms. And there are a lot of um, different, very smart words like heteroscedacity, uh, homoscedacity, multicollinearity. Um, it's, a, it's a tongue break. Yeah, of course it is. Uh, but if you look it up, you know, for instance, if you do any type of regression, there is a um, red sign saying um, if you're putting a lot of highly correlating data in your regression, you might have issues later on. And it's called heteroscedacity. Uh, so what essentially means is it has also further on down the road a huge impact on data engineering, feature engineering, uh, because if your features are essentially deriving from the same set of variables, just you name them differently, you ponder them differently, and stuff like that, those will have a huge impact on your model, and later, the results. So again, this example is just showing, again, I'm playing with um, um, some Iris data set. Uh, I can't go through all the data. Um, explaining all the lines of code, so just have to believe me. Um, and then I will explain it to you. Again, I am just playing with some super simple data, nothing more. Um, bam. And I'll explain this to you in a Jiffy. Just uh, let me find uh, like this. OK, so on one hand, I'm having, so the red line is the prediction, the, the blue line is the actual values. Um, so I'm taking Iris data set, nothing fancy. Uh, on the other hand, I'm saying, um, based on my prediction, I am sort of creating new data, the one that is highly correlated and the one that is absolutely zero correlated. And you can see the results of the prediction and I'm using the same model, which is a general linear model uh, in the same cases, um, I'm getting super different results. And this is just sort of like a presentation of a cost function uh, where I can say, okay, what happens um, if I have highly correlated or if I don't have correlated data? And this is the result. And this is Iris data set, 150 rows, nothing, uh, rows of data, nothing more. If you have any questions, feel free to um, chime in and um. okay so we've seen the med cow disease and, and iris data set um, okay now we're coming to uh, the modeling um, beforehand I was asking about L1 and L2 weights in, in, in regularization again this is very, very um, highly correlated with sampling, undersampling, oversampling um, why? Because um, if you are, anybody uh, heard of data leak term? Data leak means that you train a model on the data that, um, sorry, you give the trained model the data that the model that was trained on the data never seen before. And then you might also have the problem. Um, and you also need to know when to stop sampling so that you don't oversample or that you don't undersample. Of course, there's a lot of um, theory in behind how to choose, what to choose, et cetera, et cetera. 
The other one is validating, of course, you can do different folds of validation, cross-validation, stuff like that. You want to be sure that everything that is, sh that is put into a model um, is validated. Normalization. I have a tiny, itsy bitsy tiny example of cases when people forget about normal normalizing their data. What can happen? Um, so the, the, the demo is based on the similarity and closeness. Uh, which means that, um, like clustering, which is um, sensitive to um, distance of the data points, um, if you do, if you forget about the normalization, uh, you might have different clusters, different data, different understanding of that. And of course, knowing your metrics, again, this is a super simple example, uh, which is, by the way, in Excel. Um, what's the difference between R, M, E, C, M, A, C, M, A, A, M, A, P, A, et cetera, et cetera. All those can linger, can give you different results. And this is an example. Um, so this is just errors on a timeline data. Uh, so time series data, timeline here, uh, can give you an idea how different metrics can behave on a same data set. So which one to choose? You have to know which one um, to choose. OK, so let's go to cluster and dendrogram. And I'll just give you a quick idea um, what's happening. Um, so again, I'm playing with inches and centimeters. Those are roughly the same. So 66 inches apparently is 165-ish centimeters. Uh, I don't know. I looked it up. <laughs> uh, so this is my data set. Again, super simple. So what I'll be doing next is I'll be running a k-mean clustering. Nothing fancy. Um, and I'm just, you know, creating a data frame, putting it together. And again, this will be my k-means clusters. So those two here, one is in inches, one is in centimeters. Um, and I will do just the visualization so that I don't waste more precious time explaining. <clears throat> so you can see in both cases I've chosen deliberately two clusters because I only have like, I don't know, five, six, seven observations. One is in centimeters, one is in inches. As I said at the beginning, clustering is super sensitive to the distances. And that's why I'm getting two different results. It, what would happen or how would I correct that is to normalize the data. If I would be normalizing the data saying, instead of centimeters and instead of inches, just give me like a z-score over my data, I would have essentially the same. If I would be repeating uh, those two clustering, I would have the same result. So introducing data that you just forget about, OK, I forgot about normalization, I forgot about z-score, stuff like that, can yield to such differences. And this is, again, super small data set just to show you. Um, and you can see the data points are located totally differently. Even if I would be putting the same scale, it, in this case, it's still the same scale. But if even if I would be trying to sort of maneuver the scale of x or y, I would still have different um, measures of um, central point and, and, and distances between each of the points. Again, if you want to play, play on this data set, feel free to um, go on the GitHub and check, um, check the, um, the code. And if you can see, even the distances in this matrix are um, different. You can see seven observations, distances, you get totally different um, um, values. 
of course, what I need to do is I simply just need to, um, I can do it, you know, simply like this, saying give me standard deviation and mean and then calculate the normal, uh, uh, sorry, the, the normalized um, uh, values, or I can choose some other library which will essentially um, have the same effect. Okay, uh, going back to the slides. Okay, so I'm um, skipping this Excel because it's just different calculations, recalculations of this um, simple matrix for time series data. Again, if you are interested, go to GitHub. Um, the second part of this is um, what kind of measures are we using? How do we understand the model? The robustness of the model is very important. How do we interpret area under the curve? How do we, when do we choose um, um, the, the if, if, if you take the cor correlation uh, matrix, uh, when do we choose um, recall versus F1, stuff like that. Um, if I take um, ROC curve on different um, line, um, I would have different measures. Um, underneath the, 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 the curve, I would probably be using recall and then in the middle ROC and then something else. How do I solve this problem? There are many, many ways how to solve the problem. So instead of breaking down um, the cost function, you can create several different sub-models. Um, one of those things is SVD. Anybody heard of that? Um, you can use that to create your model um, much more robust. Over and under feeding, again, when do you want your model to be stopped? At which point you want to stop um, training the model? And many, many more. So all these are just, you know, tiny bits and pieces of common mistakes that people either tend to forget or don't know um, and because they don't know, then they sort of say, okay, I'll, I'll take ROC, saying, okay, my model is accurate 80% of the time, but I don't know essentially what is happening if I spread the data on a cost function, what's happening at the beginning, what's happening at the end. Overall, the model is performing fine. Again, I can choose different matrix, uh, different metrics, sorry, uh, and create new cost functions which essentially will give me much more robust model. How do I do that? I can use, I don't know, clustering. Um, you can use, as I said, SVD. You can use, um, I don't know, um, any type of reduction um, um, algorithms. Those will do just fine. Um, Training the model on the complete data set, or splitting the data, again, data leakage, stuff like that. This is, again, super important. Um, and there is a huge and long debate how to deploy the model, what is the frequency, when do we change or retrain the model. Again, this, is, um, this can be done based on um, um, your business model or agreement with the business, or maybe you know you see the data leakage, then you have to sort of rerun the model. <clears throat> um, sticking only to one algorithm or using the wrong one, again, is the question of knowledge. Um, so I'll just give you an example with um, taking a polynom function um, and seeing what essentially is happening to my data. Again, a very minor, small, uh, example, um, yeah, so um, what I'll be doing is, uh, first let's clean the environment just for the sake of it. So I'll take the air quality data set. There are um, 
some data points, and we have um, and we have day, month, wind temperature, solar, ozone, stuff like that. Nothing really fancy. Um, so I'm going to train the data, and I'm going to leave out um, some uh, data points. And now what I will be doing is I will be running this 10 times. Every single time that I will be running is I'll give it to the next power. So it's going to be a linear function, then to the power of 2, to the power of 3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'll store the results. So this is something like this. Again, nothing fancy. For those who can read R, um, this is the model list, uh, and this is my formula. So again, super simple. I'm just going to run this. It should be a split of a second. And of course, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run um, a ggplot and just let me find this. OK. So we can all agree that on the x, we have wind. On y, we have ozone. Um, and all the data points are essentially at this wind, we have that ozone, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the question is how to choose um, the, the, the model or how to choose the function. Uh, as you can see, this is a straight linear regression. And then this goes on and on, which is like to the power of 2, to the power of 3, 5, and 10. And as you can see, at some point, I will be starting um, overfitting. So this is a clear underfit for my uh, data points. Um, and the magenta, I think, yeah, magenta is total overfit. But probably somewhere in between the green and whatever that color is, I don't know. No, <laughs> is the right function for you. How to find it? Of course, you can use the square root of errors, the distance between the data points from your function, and you will see which one would fit you the best. Um, and that I'm not joking, you can always check the results, and you can see the actual values and the uh, um, the fitted values based on the degree of the polynomial function. So this is the 10, this is the 1, and 1 was we've seen is simple uh, linear regression. 10 is, I believe, the one which is overfitted. I can run simple statistics on that and see which line essentially performs the best. OK. Um, 10 more minutes, nice. OK, so um, this is just you know toy demos to give you an idea. And I have a lot of more demos with ROC, with, with recall, with precision functions and stuff like that, when to choose true positive, false negatives, uh, based on which data set or based on which uh, business model that you're trying to solve. So all these are essentially extremely important. And the last part is sort of like to conclude this session is visualization. Um, my favorite one is visualizing, visualizing data with wrong charts or visualizing wrong data. Um, when to choose tables and how to do all the results together. OK. To cheer you up a little bit, this one is my favorite, the pi. 50-50, because the table wouldn't be enough, I have to put not only a pie chart like this, it has to be like with some grade and, 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 and some 3D effects and stuff like that. So <laughs> just don't do it, OK. <laughs> I mean, if you fancy pie, yeah, there's a nice pie outside, but not this one. Again, um, the same thing. Uh, the problem with the pies is that essentially you can put quite a lot of different percentage inside. It always will give you um, a, the concept, the notion that this is 100%, whereas in reality, this is 109%. So that's kind of a bummer. And again, everything is just toy data. Uh, this one was taken from this website. Um, I like the color palette, but the rest is pretty much useless 
unreadable, hard to read, hard to comprehend, hard to understand. And of course, this one. So you have like one huge class and then you have two smaller and then the rest is like these tiny little dots here which makes this pretty much unreadable. And by now, I'm pretty much sure that you already figured it out that I cannot stand the pie charts. Well, yeah, this is one thing, but we can go further on. Um, these two look super similar, right? But if I just transpose those on a bar chart, I can get different bar bars, essentially. Again, the problem here is also the Y scales. So because this one was smaller number, this one is higher number, on pi it looks relatively the same, but when you put a histogram or bar chart, you can see that um, the scales are totally off. So again, when I compare it like this, um, and then I put the scale on, it's super, super confusing. Anybody was saying something? Sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's like, I, I like the scale. Um, <laughs> um, and of course, how it should be essentially is like this. So we go from having no labels whatsoever um, to this, and you can see that it sort of makes a huge, huge difference in comparison to, if I go slightly back, in comparison to this one. It's the same data. I'm just playing with visuals. And of course, my favorite one, a lot of lines which are hard to read, which you don't know which is which, etc., etc. In this case, I would either choose some aggregated values on that or just, you know, say A, B, C, and that's enough. On top of that, I've also seen Minecraft <laughs> maps like that. I mean, it's nice, yeah, it's definitely nice, but I don't know what I'm looking at, honestly. Again, it's the same data set. It's a fake small data set. And for those who go way back into 1995 when the Excel came out, you know, 3D bar charts like um, landscape of New York, this was super famous. I don't know what I'm reading here, I don't know what I'm looking here, but I can comprehend this pretty good. So again, choosing this one is not a go. Um, this happens quite often. Um, you have small values and then you have like one outlier um, and you want to use the bar chart. Usually, either you can go say, okay, I'm gonna put this on the other side with different scale, um, or there is a nice solution, an add-in for Excel for those who are into Excel, uh, which essentially sort of makes this part here much more readable. I didn't know that until I started playing with this and started looking and there is a solution to that, which is extremely nice. But otherwise, um, if you want to understand what you are showing, uh, again, a beautiful website, database catalog, um, what type of um, data are you using, go ahead. Some general rules I follow with the visualization. Um, purpose of visualizations is to make data more understandable, and that's it, and not vice versa. So I'm not doing fancy graphs just for the sake of it, I'm trying to sort of point out what um, am I doing with the data. If it feels stupid, just don't do it. Uh, if you don't understand it the next day, think of it how your customer, customer will feel. Um, some results are better told with numbers. Um, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, fancy doesn't mean better. Default colors are usually very much obvious. Keep in mind those who are colorblind, keep the schema and stuff like that. Um, and of course, colors have also meanings, not feelings, but meanings. 
red for the numbers or blue or black. You know, people do sort of connotate those. So at least, you know, try to be uh, in the same schema. And if you're showing the negative numbers, don't put the green number with the minus sign. It's sort of like. Uh, of course, the, the famous defaults in Excel through the years, which I totally like, so yeah. Okay, uh, just to wrap it up, uh, the most common mistakes, uh, ignoring data quality, which um, we've briefly touched, not exploring your data. There is, again, a lot of um, examples in the, on the GitHub repo. If you want to clone it, just go ahead. Ignoring data distribution, uh, ignoring feature engineering, Feature engineering is super important, especially for those who try to get new uh, information out of your variables. Um, watch out for under or overfeeding when you are doing modeling. Data leakage is, can also be a huge problem. Um, not addressing bias, uh, ignoring different metrics for evaluating the quality of your model, and then again, poor data visualization poor reporting, um, and of course, the last one, which was presented, the first one in this demo session was fail to understand the business, lack in domain knowledge. Um, yeah, just ask yourself the to-dos, um, rethink about the problems you're trying to align with the customer. Uh, there, is, there will always be more data available, but at what cost? This is also something that I've seen. We need more data, we need more data, but people tend not to do anything with the existing data, so don't fall for that trick. Um, always ask yourself when you are creating a machine learning model, uh, are you positive about deploying it? Are you even more positive about explaining it to your boss? trying to be more, you know, black box, glass box type of models. Some are super easy to interpret, some are very hard to interpret. If you want to go into interpretability, there are Shep, Lime, models, packages, super great for understanding what's essentially going on in these black box models, um, and always have some doubt. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of the day, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs>